uh, it's my problem tonight is I have I am a little bit like Macbeth, steeped in blood so so deep. I'm so deep into the Guthrie research that it's, it's a little bit sometimes a little bit difficult to simplify it. So what I will do is um, we look at some images from Guthrie's life and his roots in Ireland, and I'll read you. Uh, some short excerpts from the chapter, the opening chapter of uh, my manuscript at the moment, and um, then I'll take questions from the audience. And it's basically trying to introduce you, um, if you know nothing at all about Guthrie or his connections with Ireland, just introduce you a little bit to that context and the, the, how it has contributed to his creativity. Okay. Uh, so the, the the first, and Julie's going to help with the slides. Thank you. Very much. Okay. So the first the first uh, place to begin with understanding Guthrie is at the family home of Anna McCarrick. Now, Anna McCarrick is an anglicization, a rendering into English of an Irish phrase, Aon McCarrick, which means the rock on the river. And this is a, uh, it's a, it's a beautiful, it's what they call a big house in Ireland. Uh, it's the Protestant Anglo-Irish ruling classes came to power in Ireland after the 1690 Battle of the Boyne and ruled uh, in the ascendant as a Protestant ascendancy. Up, up until the Act of Union in 1801, January 1801, and then from that point on there was a slow decline as Irish nationalism rose in power uh, until 1922 when they handed over the keys of uh, English power in Ireland to Michael Collins in 1922. So Guthrie is part of that Anglo-Irish uh, dimension and that Anglo-Irish uh, historical force in Irish society. So as they declined through the 19th century and as they were sharply cut off from from identity with Ireland following the rise of the independent Irish state in 1922, a lot of the Protestant Anglo-Irish class became very creative. So they, the energy that used to be displayed in politics or medicine or in the British Army uh, was displaced into creative endeavor. Okay? So the thing that's so interesting about this house, Anna McCurick, which is today uh, an artist residence, and I'll talk about that um, you know, in, later on in the talk, is that it's very remote, it's in County Monaghan, right next to the border, right? Uh, so Guthrie was born in England, Tombridge Wells, Kent, in England in 1900. He died at this at the table here in County Monaghan, opening a rebate on his rates, which are the property taxes, so it's classic Guthrie uh, theatrical uh, visual. Uh, he's a very visual orchestral director, very high-paced director. So he's sitting at the table and he opens the rates, sees he's got a rebate or a reduction on his property taxes, smiles as a massive heart attack and drops dead. Okay. And when you visit, uh, I was very, because of Falls in Minnesota, was very kind uh, funding of my research, I was able to visit this summer uh, that very table and sit at the very chair in which he died. It's a little bit morbid, but if you're a Guthrie researcher, it's a great moment. In your, uh, so what's interesting about the house is that, of course, it's islanded. It's, in, it's very remote. You literally go down a long, it's about a 500 uh, foot long drive. You're in all this, uh, uh, evergreen forest in this conifer forest. It's about 450 acres. There's a beautiful lake. It's very, very remote. County Monaghan is not on anybody's tourist trail. It's very, very remote, secluded part of Ireland. And so Guthrie, um, politically and culturally, uh, so he was born in 1900. He's growing up in this, in, this, in this particular way. He's similar to Samuel Beckett. Beckett was growing up in Dublin under certain similar conditions part of the pro professional Protestant classes and suddenly by the forces of Irish nationalism and Irish history written out of the official script of Ireland, right? So Guthrie, uh, born in 1900, so he's, he's 12 years old uh, when the Titanic sinks. Uh, 1914, as Ulster is starting to, as the, the, count, the six counties of Northern Ireland are starting to resist any attempt to create a unified independent Ireland, the fundamental irony of Irish history is that the Unionists in the North, the very aggressive Protestant loyalists in the North, armed themselves against London. They were prepared to fight the English to stay English. It's one of these quirks of history. Uh, Guthrie's aunt, his aunt Sue, uh, was a Unionist, was a, was a very uh, aggressive promoter of the tie to Ireland, right? So Guthrie grew up in this sort of Protestant, loyalist, pro-British, British-educated, English-educated, English-accented uh, environment but yet with these deep emotional roots in Ireland and, in, and to the house. So the house is almost a character in the story. And you have to understand Anna McCary as uh, a classic Anglo-Irish um, haunted pressure cooker of the imagination for the young Guthrie as a child, growing up not knowing what's happening, what's happening uh, to his future as somebody with this Anglo-Irish identity. So his mother, his mother is uh, from County Monaghan, and if we can, if we can next one. 
we can see Anna McCary gets remote. So this is Guthrie and his sister and uh, uh, Julia Bretherton who became his wife. And this is the lake and they're at play. If we can see another slide, another next one. This is, a, this is a beautiful photograph, it's a great photograph. This is them at, uh, having a picnic. And this is uh, Guthrie with his mother, Nora Power, uh, his sister, uh, Susan Margaret Guthrie, and they're having a picnic at the haystack again at Anna McCarrick. So Anna McCarrick uh, House is a magic kingdom, like a sort of a Peter Pan Neverland. It's a place that, that created this a tremendous expansion in his imagination, tremendous expansion in self-confidence. He was the only and oldest and firstborn son uh, he was the apple of his mother's eye, and he grew up in that kind of affectionate climate, uh, tremendously confidence-building climate, but yet at the same time, his position in Ireland was crumbling all around him. Okay? He was 16 when, 19, when Easter Rising 1916 happened in, in Dublin, when Irish nationalists declared uh, an Irish republic, and out of that then came the War of Independence, 1919 and uh, 1921. Uh, the border was carved uh, just a few miles away from his house in Monaghan, a border carved the six counties of Northern Ireland away from Ireland into Nord the Northern Irish state, or Ulster as it's called today, and the 26 counties were then carved into uh, the independent Irish state. Now what's very interesting is that uh, as, Guthrie is, as Guthrie is moving between the boarding schools in England and getting the boat train and the train back to, to Anna and Carrick, he's just floating back and forth between England and Ireland in that period of time. It's classic Anglo-Irish displacement. He doesn't fit in to England fully, He's too Irish in England. He doesn't feel in, into Ar Ireland. He's he's Irish. He's too uh, he's too English in his identity. So it's a classic misfit kind of a thing. Uh, the figure it reminds me of actually most in terms of a contemporary reference is Obama. When when uh, when uh, Obama was first in America, people said uh, when he was first growing going to college, he's not black enough. He doesn't quite doesn't quite fit in. So he had to Obama had to find his identity by kind of performing and giving giving talks and brief started to find, find his identity. So Guthrie has to have a, an identity quest to find out fully what he's going to do in life. Now, in his autobiography, he describes at the age of about 14, at a Christmas dinner being asked by an uncle, what are you going to do? Uh, next. Okay. So this is the, the sister. Uh, what are you going to do in your life? And he broke down in tears. He didn't know. Okay. So the problem with Guthrie at that point as an adolescent, and this is where it's, it becomes interesting, is that he's raised in with a very traditional English upbringing, which is very much uh, dynamic in the Anglo-Irish big house culture. So he's supposed to be uh, a leader of some kind. Okay? He, go, he attends the boarding school, Wellington Boarding School, which is the traditional training ground for generals and, and, and leaders of men. His sister here, Susan Margaret, got an art school education. And he writes a letter to his sister to say, um, in the 1940s, when he is an eminent and famous director, he said, I was trained to be an army officer, and you were trained to be a suburban tennis girl, which is sort of this, the gender bias of the period. Okay? Now, Susan Margaret, uh, known as Peggy in all of his letters, marries Guthrie's college friend, Hubert Butler. Uh, this is just a recent biography of Butler. Uh, and Hubert Butler is a very interesting figure because Hubert Butler uh, has a, himself a big house and a big estate in Kilkenny, and Guthrie's sister, uh, uh, Peggy, as she's known in all the letters, is, very, is one of the driving forces behind Kilkenny Arts Week. Okay? Kilkenny Arts Week is one of the great arts weeks in Dublin today, in, in Ireland today, and there's, even, there's now a lecture series named after Hubert Butler. When Butler um, died in 1991, this biography tracks his role as a kind of a critic of the Irish southern state that took, that took off in the 1920s. So for the southern Protestant minority, of which Guthrie is a part, uh, the fundamental problem was they were written out of Irish history. Okay? So there's an official exclusive, exclusive script that's excluding uh, the southern Protestants. The south, the south of Ireland is going to be Catholic, nationalist, Irish speaking, and it aspires to absorb the six northern counties. So. Um, Figures like Butler here, figures like Guthrie, are not officially in that script. Okay? Now, just a couple of miles across the border, in the northern state of the six-county state of Ulster, which is pro-British, uh, loyalist, and very Protestant, the Catholics, the Nationalists, and the Irish speakers are all written out of the script. Okay? So you see this, this disjunction. So it's very much uh, a scenario straight out of Pirandello. One of the great touch, touchstone 
um, scripts that, that Guthrie directed all the way through his career is Luigi Pirandello's Six Characters in Search of an Author. And there's a wonderful scene in Six Characters in Search of an Author where the director is, is rehearsing his actors and in comes six characters from a play who insist on acting their scene. They've lost their author, but they still are insisting on, on uh, enacting the scenes from the play. And they go to the father, in that one, of the, one of the actors of the father confronts the director and says, don't you know, I am an immortal creation of the imagination, but I am you. And that scene is straight out of the inner psychic drama, the inner psychodrama of the interior mind of Guthrie. You can see why Guthrie was so enthusiastic about it. Guthrie was written out of the script. He was written out of the script in the South. He didn't like the hostility and the uh, way, the, the prejudice in the script in the North. And so he, he started, to, he needed to find himself in the imagination. And he found himself as a director, as a Pirandellian figure, as a figure who uh, is performing his identity, has an inner void, an inner emptiness that is resolved through performance, okay? Next. Now, this, these are, these are the, uh, these are the, uh, the child, these are the closest living relatives to Guthrie alive today, okay? So the lady in the middle is Julia Crampton. So Julia is the daughter of Hubert and Susan that we just saw. Guthrie, Guthrie and his wife never had any children. Um, they married to Richard Crampton there up to the left, and that's the, their daughter, Susanna. And that's the bust of Guthrie today in Anna McCarrick. Now why that's interesting is, as you can see reflected back through Anna McCarrick are all these portraits and all this family history. So one of the crucial formative reasons, uh, so here's the mystery. Why, why are we here? Why are we up on the eighth floor in Minneapolis? Why is this guy in this country, country uh, big house in Mana, and why has he left this tremendous legacy? It's a, actually, it's a global legacy. He's left legacies in many different places. Why are we perched up by some strange quirk of fate up this high? And you can see the, the force of, of why that is so here in this little, in this little, um, this little picture. Growing up at Anna McCary, Guthrie is a child who's staring up at oil paintings, oil portraits. He was going down the road to um, to the library. He was going. He was going. He was. He was in a pressure cooker of what Elizabeth Bowen, the great Anglo-Irish essayist, calls the family myth of achievement. Okay. So the Anglo-Irishism, an elite class, were the colonial class. They were in charge. They did run things. And suddenly they become Pirandellian characters in search of an author. They they're written out of the script. Uh, so there's a tremendous pressure to achieve, okay? And we can see here some of the pictures and the images coming back. And we can see here that the, uh, the, the bronze bust shows that Guthrie, the insecure, anxious adolescent growing up in this house, not knowing where he'd fit in, not fully fitting into England, not fully fitting into Ireland, not sure politically where each country was going, not fitting, in, fitting into the north of Ireland. He has achieved, he has, he has managed to uh, fulfill that uh, pressure. So let's look at the family tree just for a second. Okay. So uh, the Anna McCarrick house was acquired as a payment for medical bills to um, Dr. James Moorhead and his wife Martha Moorhead. So there's medical precedent. So in the house, like most normal ordinary people, if they want to be creative, they go to a library or they, you know, they go to a college, etc. Guthrie just had to walk down the hall as a child. There was the library. There were all of the antecedents, the ancestors, the grandparents. There were all the oil portraits. There was all this pressure that you, as part of the Anglo-Irish uh, psychological dynamic, was, there was this tremendous pressure, the family myth, you were supposed to become eminent. You were supposed to achieve. And so it's a, uh, it's a force that's going to push him out of Ireland. It's going to push him across the world. Okay? So very quickly, let's go through this, the, fam the family tree just for a second. So um, we start with, with the medical line. That's how Anna McCarrick was acquired. Then we see that on the next level, what's interesting is there's a Friel in the family history. Uh, Friel, uh, Friel will come into the story later on. Um, Guthrie is a tremendous mentor to the great Irish playwright Brian Friel. Um, the son is John, Dr. John Moorhead, so we still have medical doctors. He marries Su Susan Alabone Humphreys. Now what's very interesting is Dr. John Moorhead goes off to Philadelphia, leaves Monaghan, and becomes a professor, a medical professor in the university in Philadelphia. And uh, even today, in, when you visit Anna McCarrick, there's still uh, his medical writings, his le medical lectures. So there's a, one of the first layerings of pressure is this medical achievement, this intellectual presence in the house, right? 
Um, Susan Allebone Humphreys also writes memoirs of American life in Philadelphia. Okay? What's very interesting is Brian Friel, the playwright, when he visits and gets and becomes friends with Guthrie and visits Anna McCarrick, uh, is going to write his first great plays called Philadelphia, Here I Come. And memories of Philadelphia are, are beating down in, in the house. Okay, so the next generation then, Dr. John Moorhead, um, his daughter is Martha Moorhead, and uh, she marries Sir William Power. Now this is, the, this is where the theatrical genes come into the gene pool, so to speak. And this is where the oil paintings of, of an actor, a very famous actor, uh, are added to the walls. And the actor is Tyrone Power, uh, who was the absolute star. He was a comic Irish uh, actor, uh, charismatic, melodramatic comic actor, who was the absolute star of London, the London stage, of, and also toured with great success across America. Okay? And he died um, in 1841. Can we go one forward? Yeah, we'll get the time. We'll jump back to the family tree. Mr. Mm -hmm. thanks. So this is Tyrone Power. Uh, so this is the one of the one of the one of the extraordinary oil paintings beating down on the young mind. We picture uh, Tyrone Guthrie, let's say, 100 years ago, 12 years old. He's trying to figure out where he's where he's going to go. Um, and I've seen the oil painting actually of Tyrone Power, and it's almost it's four dimensional. It's it's got a little crinkle of a smile, a little gleam in the eye. You know, the, the, the black curls of the hair, it's not quite, quite fair to see it here, but it's got a whole sense that he's literally kind of looking down at you. He's almost coming out of the picture. Now, within Anglo-Irish literature, the writings that Anglo-Irish novelists and writers have done are full of haunted oil paintings. It's a great Gothic image. We've got in the great novel, Melmoth the Wanderer, Melmoth who sold his soul to the devil. There's a great painting where he's lived, the, the painting is almost alive, fiercely staring at you. Um, in, in Bram Stoker's great short story, The Judge's House, the hanging judge who's so full of malice, he's, 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 he's staring out of the picture. Uh, in Oscar Wilde's great uh, story, Picture of Dorian Gray, the whole inner psychology of the character is in, enshrined in the oil painting. So Guthrie and the Anglo-Irish grow up with this sense that the painting is not just a piece, it's not two-dimensional, three-dimensional. It's a four-dimensional living presence. It almost is speaking to you. It's almost calling to you. It's, it's, it's an exemplar. It's a model of future selves. It's asking you, what will you become? So this is a tremendous presence. Now, Power was more than just an actor. He wrote very, very, very interesting uh, recollections of uh, America before the Civil War. Uh, the Antebellum America, what wrote about recollections of the American theater scene, and he's a very, very, so again, in Anna McCarrick, there's the oil painting, and then also there's library books full of recollections, etc., bearing down on Guthrie, okay? So, next year, please. Yeah, we'll go back for a second. So, Power's son, right? So, Tyrone Power uh, dies in one of the first um, haunted stories that Guthrie tells in his autobiography in 1959, is about Tyrone Power after finishing a fantastically successful tour of America where he made a lot of money. He bought the land in which the future Madison Square Gardens would, would reside, and he buys himself um, a ticket to sail back to England. He meets a, f a friend in the streets of New York who tells him he's sailing earlier on the USS President. So Tyrone Power switches his ticket and gets on the USS President, and the USS President set, set sail, and then it hits a tremendous storm, and, it, and the whole, the whole um, ship goes down in the storm, and as the accounts of the time say, not even a bale of cotton was, just, was recovered. All hands, everybody's lost. Now at the exact same time that that was happening, on March 12, 1841, a tremendous knocking came on the door of Tyrone Power's business partner, Benjamin uh, Webster, who ran the Haymarket Theatre in London, and the butler ran up the stairs to Benjamin Webster and said, I hear a knocking on the door, it sounds like Mr. Power. And Webster, what gets out of the bed, it's very Christmas carol kind of a scene, gets out of the bed and he says, but Power's in, in America, why would we knock on the door? And he said, what's he saying? And the butler says, he says, I'm drowned, I'm drowned in the rain, I'm drowned in the rain. And the butler says, go down, open the door. And the butler toddles down, and of course it's a Dickinsonian door, he's got to take out all the bolts, etc. Opens the door, and there's nobody there. Next day, of course, they get the news, the USS President sank, Powers is dead. And this is the story that Guthrie grew up with. So it's a haunted oil portrait. It's a Power is a figure of romance. The, ha the house is extremely remote. So he's grown up in this intensity, this pressure cooker, this, this great stimulus of the imagination. So his son, Tyrone Power, Tyrone Power had six sons. 
uh, one of the sons lead, uh, uh, moves to America and, and the, eventually the offspring is Tyrone Power, the, the movie actor. Uh, but his son, his oldest son is Sir William Power, um, who gets bought a commission in the British Army, and next, next, yeah, there we go. There's the USS President. <laughs> underground, underground. Make a great play. Why don't we need a theater to put it on? Anyway. Yeah. Uh, next, next, please. Okay, we'll come back to Reverend Guthrie in a second. Next, one more. Okay, so this is the this is the son of Tyrone Power, Sir William Power. Tyrone Power. Now this is, when you visit Anna McCarrick, uh, this is the, probably the most interesting oil portrait that's bearing down. So it's very similar to Guthrie, okay? Guthrie's full name is William Tyrone Guthrie. Uh, he was knighted for his services to the theater in 1961, so he became Sir William Tyrone Guthrie. Okay, we'll go back and talk about the Guthrie connection in a moment. So you can see that he's literally absorbing, today in neuroscience they call this mirror neurons, the way people mirror, uh, if you have a lot of obese friends you tend to be obese or whatever. You tend to really mirror behavior. So he's, the mirror neurons here are the haunted, these haunting oil portraits that are be beating down on the young Guth Guthrie. And now Sir William Tyrone Power is interesting. He went all over the world, and he deserves a full, full biography in himself. Uh, it hasn't been done. You can find little bits and pieces on, on the internet, little, little short accounts. Of, but he went as far away as uh, the Crimea. Uh, he fell in love with the daughter of Annie McCary. Now, what was he doing in Monaghan, remote, remote Monaghan? In the 1840s, when he was a lieutenant in the British Army, he was sent on famine relief in 1849 uh, to get the poor, starving people around Anna McCarrick House to dig a trench to help drain part of the swampy land at the top of Anna McCarrick Lake. And you can still visit that part of the uh, estate and see, see some of the remnants of that. And he fell in love with the beautiful Martha Moorhead, uh, the daughter of, of Dr. John Moorhead of, of Anna McCarrick House. They didn't want, I don't have time to go into this, uh, forgive me, they, they, the parents did not want their daughter to marry this rascally uh, English captain, but he was persistent and they got married. Now he was sent all over the world and, and so he's a classic colonial figure as the British Empire expands across the world. Uh, he becomes a Knight Commander of the Order of Bath. Uh, he's sent as far away as New Zealand, he's sent to China, he's sent to, um, he visits Australia, he goes to the Crimea, uh, he, he tra he's a world traveler and he writes memoirs. He's got a fantastic book called Sketchbook of New Zealand where he takes all kinds of interesting sketches of uh, the, the, flo the, the flora and the fauna of New Zealand, which is still a fantastically exotic, far-flung part of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the world. So here's another model. Now, he, w he lived until he was 92. So Guthrie, Tyrone Guthrie, the founder of this theater, knew him as a child. He died in 1911, okay? Um, and he was responsible for always bringing the Irish servants to Tunbridge Wells, where Guthrie was born, in Kent. Royal T Tunbridge Wells, very conservative, British side of, of, uh, of Kent, and he would bring the Irish servants, and they'd live in the, the villas in Tunbridge Wells, and then he'd bring them all back to uh, Monaghan. So he was part of, he created that whole dynamic in Guthrie's childhood. His daughter, uh, Nora Power, marries Dr. Thomas Guthrie, and I think we need to go back one. Yeah. Okay, so she is, she is the descendant of this uh, gentleman. The foremost Scottish divines is called Reverend Thomas Guthrie, okay? So Guthrie's, this is the Scottish side of the Guthrie name. Guthrie's a Scottish name. And the house is sometimes described as looking like almost like a Scottish house. It's like an, so it's this hybrid, multiple, multiple identity, with many layers of identity in the house. Now, Guthrie, this Guthrie is an extremely interesting gentleman. Again, I can only talk about him for a couple of, couple of seconds. Um, there's a big statue to him in Edinburgh when you walk down Princess uh, Street on the way up to Edinburgh Castle. He's responsible for founding the Ragged Schools. He's one of, he's one of the great preachers, um, he was one of the great inspirational feature, figures in Scottish Pre Presbyterian lore, um, and again, he wrote many, many memoirs, okay? So not only is he, and there's a huge oil portrait of him in, in, in uh, Anna McCurdy, and not only has he written many books, many, 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 many sermons, but again, he's written, ma uh, he's, he's a tremendous presence in uh, Guthrie's life. So if we could just go back, Julie, to the family tree for a second, okay? So, his descendant, his great, his grandson, Reverend Thomas Guthrie, uh, his his grandson marries Nora Power, uh, and Nora Power uh, gives birth to Tyrone Guthrie in 1900 in Tunbridge Wells. So Guthrie then is growing up as a child. Uh, he's growing up in um, an Anglo-Irish house with all of these oil portraits. This this. 
this uh, library that's sort of got this tremendous presence of um, the family antecedents and the precursors bearing down on him. Okay? So uh, he's, he suffers as an adolescent, he suffers from a, a deep uncertainty as to what he will do, and he ends up getting to traditional Anglo-Irish education. He gets a scholarship to Oxford, and he goes to Oxford and becomes a, um, a student of history, and then he gets into the Oxford University Dramatic Society. Uh, and then he be what's interesting about the Oxford University Dramatic Society is they always hired once a year a professional director from London who came and would direct the students at Oxford, and then they take the production to the new theatre in London. So the students were exposed to a professional level of, um, of directing. Okay. So um, Guthrie was, was cast in Henry IV Part I, and he then he went to uh, London and he, he was bitten by the, conscious of the fact that he had this uh, Scottish uh, religious dimension to him, he had this military dimension to him, uh, and also that he had this medical dimension through the family precursors. Uh, he'd struggled as, a, as to what he would do and decided he would, he would try and see if he could work as an actor. Now the crucial, this is the crucial point in Guthrie's uh, career, and that he's a complete failure as an actor. And he's very clear about this. He's too tall. He's too tall. He doesn't quite fit. Um, and it's very humbling for him. And it's quite a typical moment actually in the biography of anybody who's ever done anything eminent. It's how they handle failure. Uh, and Guthrie um, was cast in the role of Captain Shotover in George Bernard Shaw's play uh, Heartbreak House. He, wrote, he spent the whole summer learning the lines on the first day of rehearsal uh, directed by the Belfast director, James Fagan. He came out and gave his first speech and was told by Fagan, uh, you know, took him aside and said, look, this has been a terrible mistake. You're too young for the role. You don't fit. You can go home or you can come back tomorrow and you can sweep the, you know, you can sweep the rehearsal space and start at the beginning as an assistant to the assistant to the assistant stage manager. And Guthrie, uh, while humiliated and shocked, uh, came back and then started to learn from Fagan as he puts it himself how to put all the elements of theater into a unity, okay? And this is what's interesting about James Fagan, and he deserves to be better known as a figure. Uh, he ended up dying in, in Hollywood, actually, was that he's from Belfast, um, and he worked his way up into the professional uh, uh, theater profession in London, um, and he became then the first mentor or role model for Guthrie, okay? Guthrie wasn't going to become a medical doctor. You see that his father, the Scottish surgeon, Dr. Thomas Guthrie, was obviously a figure who fit perfectly in Anna McCary, but all of its doctors, etc. Uh, so the struggle for, for Guthrie is how am I going to, this is the, cr the crucial point I want to make today as we kind of go through this uh, sort of, sort of uh, obscure family tree, how am I going to create my own oil painting? How am I going to leave s some space on the shelf? How am I going to fulfill the pressure of the family myth uh, as a displaced Anglo-Irish person? How am I going to achieve this, this role. And under the mentoring of James Fagan in the 1920s, as Ireland is dissolving to a civil war, uh, Guthrie figures out that becoming a, the Pirandellian director, uh, playing a role, playing the role of director, self-inventing himself, uh, authoring his own script, breaking out of the exclusive scripts and actually authoring his own script, putting the, uh, the, the marks on the oil painting, so to speak, sketching in his own uh, destiny is the way to go. And paradoxically, that's through the, me the method of, um, of uh, theater, okay? So quite quickly, in 1923, um, he establishes himself in Cambridge, the Cambridge Festival Theater, and then he's, he is offered the job by the BBC, um, and he goes to become the radio producer at the first radio station the BBC opened in Belfast, 2BE it was called. And what's interesting about that is that he starts writing script, scripts himself. So Guthrie was many things. He was a, a radio producer. He was a radio uh, playwright in his own way. Um, and he started calling himself Tyrone Power. He used to sign his little scripts as Tyrone Power. And his mother, who was listening at the creaking Marconi radio in Anna McCary, uh, about 60 miles or so from Belfast, where her son was carving out his own career, would always ask him, who's this actor? Who's this guy, Tyrone Power? He's, it's kind of a funny name. And he, Guthrie would always say, you know, that's actually me. That's, you know, so Guthrie's fulfilling and unfolding the family myth as he starts to establish himself in Belfast. Now, what's interesting about Guthrie, and the most important quality, I think, in terms of his Anglo-Irish um, heritage, is that he was a nonconformist. Okay? Uh, in his autobiography, he makes it very clear that when he was in the English boarding school, 
world. It was a world of conformity, absolute suppression of identity. And because he'd been moving back and forth between Ireland and England, um, the classic definition of the Anglo-Irish figure is they're on a boat between England and Ireland. That was their fate. That's where their identity was. They're always in between. They're always displayed, displaced. Uh, Guthrie did not conform, would not conform to any of the expected um, social roles offered to him. Okay? He always described them as anthills. He said there, it's an anthill of conformity. So most people given a job in the BBC are there for life. And they wear the blue suit and that's it. They're there for life. Guthrie was there for maybe a year at most. Uh, then he was given the opportunity to run the Scottish national players in Scotland. So again, following the, the shaping force in Guthrie is the family pressures, is the oil paintings, these four-dimensional oil paintings. That gave him a chance to um, uh, that gave him a chance to follow in his father's footsteps, to get to know Glasgow, to get to know Edinburgh, to get to know to follow in his great grandfather's footsteps, Rev Reverend Thomas Guthrie. Um, then in the 1920s, uh, he slowly built his reputation up and became uh, a London producer uh, with the Westminster Theatre. They started directing, directing Shakespeare. Uh, the crucial turning point for him was 1932, the production of Love's Labour is Lost. This was seen by uh, the resident director at the Old Vic. Uh, yeah, sir, stop here for a moment. Uh, thank, thank you, Julie. Great job. Uh, so he was, he was offered the role of, uh, he was, this production of Love's Labour's Lost was seen by the resident producer, Harcourt Williams of the Old Vic, who was intrigued by Guthrie's style. And Guthrie, as a director, was very, very interesting. His formation is he's Protestant, but he writes to his sister a very, fanta fa very fascinating letter. And Guthrie's letters have not been published, and they should be published. His letters are fascinating. He writes a fascinating letter saying that being a Protestant is like being in a stone tower with narrow, narrow slits where I've got no ability to sort of un un unleash the emotional storms I feel within me. He was always a Protestant. He was always very religious. That, that was part of his, 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 uh, his career was always, as he said in another letter to his sister, you praise your creator by working hard. He had a very strong Protestant work ethic. But he was, a, he was not the typical dour, humorless, northern Protestant uh, that Ireland tends to produce en masse. Okay? Um, particularly in, a certain, in, in July 12th. He said he, he, in, he had reversed that trait, and he was a sort of a festive communal Protestant. He was, he was a Protestant who saw, who wanted to create a kind of a communal festivity. The other trait he reversed in his, in his psychology is the general. He was trained in the military boarding school of Wellington. He was trained to be a leader of men, to be an officer, to be part of the, command, to be part of the commanding class of a British empire. The only problem was the British Empire was falling apart all over the place, beginning with Ireland. Okay? Uh, so he, in any memoir of Guthrie, he's always described as looking like an eccentric general or an elongated general, etc. So he, instead of being the general and ordering people around as a director, he was very much a catalyst. He was an orchestral director. He wanted to create a communal, uh, a communal environment. For example, he never blocked the actors. Okay? He never told the actors, stand there, take two steps right, and stop. And so actors usually block, they write in, where do I stand? He let, the, he let them flow, okay? So it was very much, it was very much more of a sense of, of being a catalyst as a, a director and letting them, emerge into, letting, the, letting them emerge and discover their own uh, characterization. So it was very much a, he was very much a co-creator, he was a catalyst, he was an orchestral director. He saw himself, he saw uh, the, the theatrical text as like a musical score, but it's crescendos and it's climaxes. And he saw he was very much a very high-paced, energetic, vibrant, energizing kind of director. In other words, everything that was that was closed off in the Ireland of his background, right? Everything that was frozen, all these frozen scripts. Once he got his hands on a creative script, it was an extraordinary explosion of energy, an explosion, an extraordinary egalitarian form of directing. Nobody was better than anybody else. It was very inclusive. The only thing about Guthrie that is very interesting was he was a rigid disciplinarian. You had to be there in time. You had to know your lines. You had to be prepared to work very hard. So very Protestant in that Protestant kind of caricatured kind of way of, of a Protestant work ethic. But at the same time, you were free to find your character and to co-create. That's why he worked with all of the great, now today we call them the sirs. And he was a mentor figure for Laurence Olivier. Uh, he was a tremendously important figure in the absolute, absolute father figure for Alec Guinness hugely important figure for Alec Guinness, shaped Alec Guinness, brought Alec Guinness to Anna McCarrick. In fact, the director of, of Anna McCarrick told me, Robbie McDonald, when I was there this summer, that uh, that's the chair that Alec Guinness used to sit in, that's the chair 
Tyrone Guthrie used to sit in and they used to read Shakespeare and read scripts and try out different, different roles. Um, so he, was, he, had this, he had this tremendous freedom as a kind of a transcending the dualities that were tearing, at, tearing him apart, so to speak, or tearing apart any kind of normal settled identity. Everything was settled. Everything was unsettled. Everything was, was slightly distorted. So just give you some of the, um, give me for treating you like a class for a moment, because this is the point. You should be writing this down. Don't, don't write it down. And so let me give you the, these are the five Anglo-Irish dualities. There's about 50, but I'm going to condense them to about five. So obviously the first duality is the name, Anglo-Irish. That means you're English in Ireland. So in other words, you're a misfit. Okay? It's, like, like, it's like Obama. He's not black enough to some people. Okay? Or he's too white, etc. He doesn't fit in. Um, so that's a fantastic gift, though, for a creative personality, because it gives you a tremendous uh, urge to create and organize your own world. The simplest definition of creativity is putting order on things. Why did they build Stonehenge? They were trying to show some, put some kind of order on the, on the movement of weather and, and the stars, etc. Okay, so the first thing we've talked about is the family myth of achievement, an absolutely crucial pressure. And here's, the, here's the, the point I'd like to make today, is we have an extraordinarily huge, massive portrait of Tyrone Guthrie on the street downstairs, right? Can that become a four-dimensional haunted oil portrait acting as a pressure on us in Minnesota and in America? And if, and if it can be, what would be the lesson? If Guthrie as a child was looking up at those oil portraits, firing his mirror neurons and trying to figure out where he would go in his life, how can America today, in this kind of Tom Friedman analysis that America is in decline, is a little bit frozen, is not quite as where it was, wasn't as visionary. Amer the Guthrie Theater is referenced in the opening of Tom Friedman's book, uh, that used to be us, as a great cultural achievement, it's showing America's high standing, its, its enlightenment. How can Guthrie himself then become that four-dimensional oil painting? Okay? So he becomes then not a family myth of achievement, but a Minnesota myth of achievement. The Minnesotans should be a little bit more aware of how Guthrie can teach them to renew uh, their own lives and make uh, things that don't make sense. We certainly have, almost seem to have two exclusive scripts in the divisions in the political uh, sphere in America today. Okay, so the second thing is colonial insecurity. So the Anglo-Irish were a colonial class that came and took the land from the native Irish. And that's the fundamental insecurity. Uh, and that does play out, strangely enough, in Tyrone Guthrie's life. I'll just give you a very quick story about that. So in his will, so he travels the world. Let's just sum up his career very quickly. Uh, he basically spends most of his career with the Old Vic Theatre in London, which you can still go to today. And the Old Vic was the cradle of the British National Theatre. In 1963, when Guthrie was here in Minneapolis directing um, uh, Hamlet in May 1963, uh, Laurence Olivier was directing Peter O'Toole at the exact same time in May 1963 at the Old Vic, and the exact same play, Hamlet. Now, Laurence, Laurence Olivier is a great actor, but not known as a great director. The person who should have been there was Tyrone Guthrie. Tyrone Guthrie was universally acknowledged as the great British director. The problem was he wasn't British fully. He was Anglo-Irish. So he's, he was always questioning the anthill of conformity. That's like they, they set you up to play a very specific role, and he's determined to rebel against that. So he had that rebellious, displaced refusal to fit into the anthill ant expectation that comes out of this displaced Anglo-Irish condition. Uh, so the colonial insecurity. So Guthrie, as a, uh, in his late 60s, uh, is really paying much more closer attention. You no, know, all the way through the from his from his all the way through the 1960s. Forgive me. Um, he's paying much more clo closer attention to his community in Monaghan, and um, starts a little jam factory. Tries to set up get employment going for the local uh, youth. Um, and then the final gesture that he makes is he tries to give the entire house that we saw and the 450 acres and all of the oil paintings and heirlooms and family artifacts and books and the whole, in other words, the whole, the whole Guthrie power uh, sort of archive and identity, the whole thing, he tries to give it to his servant, Seamus McGorman, this steward who was his, because McGorman was Catholic, was part of that, that um, cheated out community that lost land. Uh, now this is, this is a very, it was a great theatrical gesture, but a very poor reading of uh, Irish history in relation to how that family got the land. The family was given, the house was given to pay medical bills. So nobody was, nobody stole it from anybody in that particular circumstance. Now, Hubert Butler that we saw earlier, uh, Guthrie's brother-in-law stopped Guthrie from doing that. And what's very interesting is that Guthrie was here at the Guthrie Theater directing Chekhov. 
and Chekhov's Uncle Vanya and the Cherry Orchard are all about how to dispose of an estate. And Guthrie, back in Ireland, is living in a very Chekhovian, Cherry Orchard-like estate, and it's just being as blind as Chekhov's characters. So at a certain point, while the oil paintings and the library shelf had inspired him, Guthrie still had these very uh, paradoxical blind spots as a great director. He was very blind in his reading of some people. He was very blind in terms of, of, of what he was trying to do to his, with his family history. But to imagine somebody trying to give away the entire house and all, these, all of the, all of the uh, property and land and memories, etc., to uh, a servant can only be imagined because there's still some fundamental insecurity that they're colonial, that they don't fully fit into Ireland. Okay? And that is what's am animating and firing up the imagination that has led to places like Guthrie Theatre here. Okay, so again, the, the other duality is that he goes to England, he, they say, he say he's Irish, he comes to Ireland, they say he's English, he doesn't fit in. Uh, number four, the, the house was a laboratory, so the Guthrie Theatre, while it certainly started in discussions in the Plaza Hotel, this theatre here, certainly started in discussions in the Plaza Hotel in New York in the 1950s, the full plan, according to Guthrie's book, A New Theatre, the full plan really was brainstormed when he invited, invited Oliver Ray and Peter Zeisler to Anna McCarrick House in Monaco. So he took them all the way across. Back in the, in the late 1950s, that was, this was a big, big production. He took them all the way across to Ireland so they could stay and they could really talk and chew, chew over the um, founding of this theater. And the reason they wanted to found the theater was, again, that very much that Anglo-Irish rebelliousness. Just about all of the theater in America was concentrated in New York, which was an economic insane asylum, is the way they've they, they put it. There had been slow movements towards a regional theater. Um, Joseph uh, Ziegler, in his book on the regional theaters, calls them acorns. But the Guthrie, this, this fully realized vision of a classic space thrust stage theater, um, really rooted in a community, um, was seen as an oak. So this is like the oak that came down out of Guthrie's vision. So that, that sense of the house as a laboratory uh, as a place where you could come up with big schemes. Now the old colonial mindset, of course, was you go and you try and colonize China, or you try and run, organize colonies in New Zealand. I mean, this is in the, in the family roots. But for Guthrie, it's to reinvent theater itself. And then the, fa the fifth uh, duality is this Pirandellian thing that he's excluded. And because he's excluded from the, the scripts in the south of Ireland, I mean, he's a southern Irish Protestant in a, in a society that's predominantly nationalist and Catholic promoting the Irish language and is trying to exclude him, and it and and calls for uh, self-invention. Now, surely the question would arise, haven't we heard about the Abbey Theatre in Dublin? Didn't Ireland have its own theatrical tradition? And so this guy that's coming in and out of Ireland, getting the boat over and then getting the train up to Monaghan, didn't he have anything to do with the Abbey Theatre? And the answer is yes. He was invited in 1929 by Lennox Robertson, who was the uh, sort of assistant to WB Yeats, the director of the Abbey, he was invited to become a director of the Abbey Theatre in Dublin as early as 1929, but he did not like the programming, which he thought was too nationalistic, too ideological. Again, it's freedom, it's freedom from anthills. Whether the anthill is an Irish anthill or an English anthill, Guthrie's always trying to transcend the, the anthill. And when he was a very famous director in the 1960s, and the Abbey Theatre burned down in 1951 and then was rebuilt in Dublin in 1966, and that's the same Abbey Theatre you visit today. He was in, again invited um, by actors in the Abbey who went up to Anna McCarrick House. Um, ironically, one is called Vincent Dowling, no relation to the current director, Joe Dowling. Uh, went up to Anna McCarrick House and invited him to become the uh, artistic director of the Abbey, but he said he's too busy with the Guthrie and the other commitments in Minneapolis. He couldn't do it. So they, he was asked again and again, but he, he, did not, uh, he did not think that he could fit into an ideological theater. For him, he, he had to fit into a much more expansive uh, kind of theater, okay? Uh, next, please. So these dualities are pulling at him and creating a displacement, a wonderful creative displacement. Um, we see this creative displacement in a lot of other Anglo-Irish figures. Uh, we see it in Jonathan Swift. Swift was born in England, uh, moved to Dublin, didn't fit into Dublin, looked back in frustration on England, so we have, see this figure, you can see it in Samuel Beckett, we see it in Oscar Wilde, we see it again, these dualities. And Guthrie's, they transcended it through imaginative work. Guthrie tried to be a playwright. He did write, some of his plays are interesting to read, and his radio plays are interesting to read, but for him, he transcended it through theater design, okay? Um, so one of, the, one of the consequences of these dualities is you really start to see culture in itself. This is an analysis that goes back to Swift. Swift really, could really see the human being 
in kind of the totality because he didn't fit into Ireland, he didn't fit into England. So that displacement gives a fantastic creative distance that deepens the insight somebody has. Okay. Um, so what Guthrie, what Guthrie saw was that the way theater was organized was still kind of hierarchical. It was a proscenium, proscenium arch stage, kind of audiences sat back from the actors, and he wanted to have a much more communal experience, um, get, have a much more festive, communal, equal, ritualistic kind of uh, immersion in, in uh, theater. So again, I've talked about this briefly, but he reversed the traits of Dower Protestantism and found a best of Protestant ritual. Okay, so today in Ireland, they call this becoming a, uh, the kind of, it's like combining ca Catholic and Protestant. You become a proto or a Catestant. You sort of s smash together these two things. Guthrie liked ritual, he liked communion, but still he had this, this kind of Protestant uh, severity and discipline. And again, he reversed the traits of the military general. Okay, so the theater design, and now this is a fantastic story, and I, I, I won't, uh, uh, but the, how we discovered this uh, theater design is it's with the Old Vic's tour in 1937 with Laurence Olivier to, uh, to uh, Elsinore Castle in Denmark where Shakespeare sets the play. But uh, they were rained out, so it was a downpour of rain, very much like Tyrone Power knocking at the door of Benjamin Webster. Uh, they were rained out from the castle walls and they went into the hotel and Guthrie had the critics put all of the, uh, he said the critics have to do something, they're just sitting there. He had the, he had the critics put all of the, the chairs in a big U shape, um, and then the actors kind of played down, much down, more further down than they were, played down into that U shape. And that's kind of where the big intuition for a kind of a thrust stage that would play out into the um, audience happened. So, so he's always seeking to transcend while responding to the family myth and being forced to achieve outside Ireland. Uh, and like uh, Tyrone Power, he becomes a figure in the Canadian theater and in the American theater. He's just following the footsteps of those oil paintings. That's all he's doing. He was in England and he was in Scotland, following the footsteps. He's a, he visits Australia. The Australians want to know if they want if they should have a national theater. Following the footsteps of uh, Sir William uh, Power, he says, "No, we don't have a national theater. Uh, it's an anthill to the way from it." Uh, so here's here's his conclusion, and I'm concluding on this. Uh, his conclusion is. Uh, he concludes his biography by insisting on a spiritual and communal ritual. I believe that the purpose of a theater is to show mankind to himself and thereby to show to man God's image. And he saw that thrust stage design is permitting a closer and more communal participation in the sacred yet exuberant mystery of drama. Next. Okay, so this is just a couple of photos. This is the old Vic, still going strong, I'm glad to say. It was the cradle of the National Theater. Uh, and one more thing. This is uh, Guthrie and Elsinore, 1937. It does look a little bit uh, like his, the multi-levels, like the kinds of theater spaces uh, he was fascinated by in Stratford, Ontario, etc. This is a couple of this is the day after they were rained out, so they're performing on the walls in the on the in, in the castle of Elsinore, 1937, for the crown heads of Europe. But actually, they were the first night they were forced to go inside Marinus Hotel. By going into the hotel, they came up with this fantastic intuition of the thrust stage. And Guthrie realized that thrust stage in um, the Edinburgh Festival 1948, in Stratford, Ontario in Canada 1953, and then here in the, uh, the Guthrie Theatre in 1963. So that's why we're entering, that, we're entering that 50th anniversary now of those intuitions, going all the way back to that little child staring up at that oil painting, paintings, those oil paintings, in Anna McCarrick House uh, in County Manor. Uh, now the will, just to, to wrap things up, so his will was changed because of the resistance of his brother-in-law, Hubert Butler, to giving away everything. Hubert Butler said, look, forget about this Anglo-Irish anxiety. We're as Irish as anybody. Forget about these exclusive scripts. You should know that. You, should, you deal with scripts. Uh, give the house to the arts councils, north and south, and make it a kind of a cultural oasis and a cultural utopia where artists from all over the world can come, including Ireland, of course, can come and work on their um, whatever art they're doing, whether musicians, dancers, etc. And that is what has happened to Anna McCarrig. Anna McCarrig is now an artist's, um, an artist's uh, residence. He changed his will, and before he died, he got this set up in 1971. It took, a, took 10 years for all the funding to come together, and it was opened by Brian Friel, uh, who, was a, who, was a tremendous, who owes tremendous debts to um, Tyrone Guthrie. It was opened by Brian Friel, the great Irish playwright, the great living Irish playwright, in 1981. So when the Guthrie here celebrated 
moving the whole Guthrie into this huge, big, massively, tremendously reinve reinvented space in, in 2006. Guthrie's house, Anna McCary, was also celebrating 25 years of being an artist's residence. And so it, it always kind of seemed uh, obvious that the Guthrie Theatre and Anna McCary should somehow be connected. And I'm very happy to say Louise, the education director here, uh, showed, showed fantastic vision. And uh, the Guthrie is going to give a fellowship to somebody to go somebody affiliated with the Guthrie to go um, for a residency, residency at Anna McCarrick sometime in 2013, and they'll be announcing that in December. So a living connection between the Guthrie Theatre here in Minnesota and the absolute laboratory, the absolute formative crucible of Guthrie's imagination, because of all these interesting dualities and displacements, will start to be, uh, become a living reality beginning next year as part of the 50th anniversary of uh, Guthrie. And so for an audience like you guys who are interested in the connection between Minnesota and Ireland, um, and also because, let's be honest, normally, I mean, normally somebody from my particular background in Ireland, we don't pay attention or we, we're, we're sort of, we sort of don't pay sufficient attention to the Anglo side of the Anglo-Irish tradition. Just to look at this tradition and say, hey, this is actually really, really interesting. Um, it's been something that I've really appreciated, is really trying to broaden my horizons and see how the way scripts are authored, authored are very political and should be open to questioning and should never just be taken as given. Um, uh, so I think I better stop at that, that point. Thank you very much.